Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February Astronomy Fundamentals Program of the Naperville Astronomical Association here from chilly northeastern Illinois. Uh, thank you for joining us. I did want to just start out tonight. I'm Drew Carhart, the current president of the club. I wanted to briefly, before we get to midnight's presentation, mention uh, what our Fundamentals Program Series is, uh, just to fill those people in who are new to us. Uh, we've been doing a monthly uh, meeting program at our meetings since 1973. And uh, so that's been going on for quite a while, but in uh, the year 2000, we started our Fundamentals Series. And the, the intent of Fundamentals is to have uh, our regular programs, we oftentimes have uh, guest speakers come in from uh, who are research scientists, who are uh, university educators, uh, other people in astronomy related fields, sometimes people from other organizations around here. But our fundamental series is always presented by a member of the club. And as the name suggests, we try to tackle one topic and present it really from the basics. So somebody who's just getting started in astronomy and isn't familiar with something can uh, hopefully uh, get a foothold in understanding what we're talking about. Um, so that's been since the year 2000. Since last year in April, we've been um, streaming these programs and all of our back issues, as it were, from the months between then and now are up on our YouTube channel. So you might want to take a look at that. And uh, currently, we're still working to get a nice short little URL for that. But uh, you can find us easily at YouTube if you go there and you search for Naperville and astronomy. You'll find not only the fundamentals programs since uh, last, April, last year, April, but our regular meeting programs and a number of live streamed observing sessions that we've done uh, during that time. So that's all up there on YouTube, look for us there. And uh, if you see something you like, subscribe and you'll get notices or you'll pop up in your YouTube feed when we put out new presentations in the future. Uh, tonight's program, as usual, if you have, since it's a live program, if you're watching and you have any questions for the speaker, if you're watching us on Facebook, you can simply put them in the comments column. And our uh, control room person, Jim, was following that, and he will pass along those questions to, to the speaker. Uh, if you are watching on the club website or uh, just prefer using email, you can email us. And uh, he will also be, Jim will also be following our email inbox to see if, what pops in there to pass anything along. So without further ado for tonight, um, we have, again, a member of the club, Steve is going to talk to us about uh, who Charles Messier was. And uh, if you're an amateur astronomer of any sort, you've certainly heard the name and you're probably quite familiar with that because he's an important figure uh, for us amateur astronomers. And then going in, go into what a Messier marathon is. So uh, buckle up and <laughs> I'm going to turn over the, uh, the airwaves to Steve and uh, Stop sharing here, and he will give us tonight's presentation. So there you go, Steve, here on the air. All right. Thank you, Drew. And, and thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. Um, let me get this out of the way. OK. Um, any Messier presentation uh, always starts with a little bit of history of, of Charles Messier, who he was. Um, he was, um, he had a bad life, I guess, really. He, he uh, was the 10th child of, um, you know, of 20, uh, sorry, 12 people, 12 children. And, uh, his father passed away when he was 11. He, uh, he got interested in, in astronomy, I think, through surveying and, uh, went on to become one of the, uh, most famous comet hunters of all time. He discovered 20 comets, um, co-discovered 20 comets and 13 by himself. Here's a, here's a quick picture of him uh, or a rendering, I guess. Uh, this is one of the better ones that I could find. Um, 
so Messier created this list, which we all know about. Uh, he kept a list of all known objects that looked like comets, because of course he's a comet hunter, but were not comets. This was to avoid confusion while hunting for new comets. So if you've ever had a chance to, to watch a comet or view a comet to a telescope, you know that they don't move very fast. They're, they're these fuzzy balls and there's lots of fuzzy things out there. And uh, you know, there's a certain level of frustration with, with looking at these things and not seeing them move and realizing, oh, this is something, something other than a comet. So he also went out and he decided to, to help his fellow astronomers by publishing uh, a series of lists of these objects, their uh, description and their, their right sensor and declination and all that stuff. Uh, he published three, three sets of lists over his life. Um, his last list, um, well, every time he published a list, he, he added to it. So essentially at the end of it, at the end of his life, at, the end of his last list, he only had 103 objects. Well, we have today 110 objects, and, and that came about because, you know, being avid astronomer, hobbyists, we couldn't leave things alone. We had to go off and dig through his his notes and his logs. And uh, from 1921 to 1966, historians found additional objects that. Uh, he had not recorded in his list, but were worthy of his list. Um, and so today we have 110 objects. Uh, so, okay, what is a Messier Marathon? A Messier Marathon is an astronomical activity in which the participants attempt to observe all 110 objects in a single night. Um, the activity can be a, a social event, can be a competitive event, it could even be a solitary event. Of course, you know, with the COVID, uh, it's most likely that you're going to have to take this on yourself until things uh, clear up um, with the, uh, the COVID. Messier Marathon started to become popular in the 1970s. There are a couple of people who published uh, some uh, articles in Sky and Telescope, and uh, they, they became very popular. Uh, the origin of who started first is pretty murky. Um, some people on the West Coast claim they did it. Some people uh, in the Midwest claim that they did it. And uh, I guess that's for historians to, to figure out. Here's a picture of a supposed Me Messier Marathon. Um, I really like this picture, the green laser, uh, the, the time lapse, and all the red flashlights. And uh, so, pretty cool picture. This is uh, courtesy of uh, Bayback Tafiri, Tafreshi. Um, okay, so why are we giving this presentation now? Um, the best times, it turns out, here's a, here's a graph of the visibility of messy objects at roughly 40 degrees latitude over a period of a year. And this chart doesn't doesn't vary over time other than the fact that it varies over one year. So it turns out the best time of the year to try and do the full 110 objects is starting in February and ending, you know, middle of April. Um, so that's why we're giving the talk right now. This is the prime time to be starting to think about doing this. Um, the other lucky thing is if you look at the bottom of the scale, it actually ends or, you know, the near the bottom is really 90 objects and that goes throughout the year. So basically any time of the year, you can actually go and run a marathon of your own and with, with, you know, with your training and skill, you can, you can get 90 for sure. In February, March, um, you can do all 110. So, a Messier Marathon is a lot like a real marathon. Hey, Steve, real, real quick, you have a question from Facebook before oh, you. Sure. Uh, Aaron asks, any idea how he missed so many in the, I don't know what word he's saying, Mark Mercarian era? Or basically was, was it a lot of these objects just beyond what uh, his telescope could resolve? Uh, 
I would I would guess that's probably part of the, the case that his his scope was you know of certain quality and um, I mean there are just thousands of different objects you, you think about the different lists that have, have come about the NGC lists um, uh, you know, and I think um, it was you know just his focus on certain areas of the sky as well. So I don't know, if that's, that's my best guess at that. Any other questions? No, that's everything. So you, I guess you have to realize if, if you're looking for comments, you're, you're usually looking in a certain uh, latitudes to try and avoid, you know, you're not gonna be looking, uh, you're, you're kind of looking along the ecliptic, but if you look at the distribution of his, his uh, of the objects, they're they're all over the place. So he did did a fairly good job. I I, I wouldn't discredit him for that. Um, I really want to kind of drive home the point that um, a marathon, a Messier marathon, is a lot like a real marathon, and and we'll use that metaphor through, for the presentation. It takes a great deal of preparation and planning. Uh, you have to practice your skills. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of different skills that you'll have to sharpen and, and possibly even you know learn for the first time uh, a lot of train sessions just like a real, uh, real marathon runner you got to get out there and and, and run and we'll, we'll talk about what that run what running means but certainly a lot of a lot of uh, training sessions uh, you got to know the course uh, if you're going to do the chicago marathon you know you got to know where you'll be turning you got to know where the water is at uh you know where to get your refreshment um you know, wh whether you're going to be going in into the wind or out of the wind, all that stuff. There's a lot of game day preparation required. And of course, you know, if you're running a road marathon, you want to pace yourself. And, and in this case, we want to pace ourselves throughout the night. And lastly, uh, <laughs> when it's over, you'll be glad it's over. So what are the skills uh, that are required to do a, mar a Messe marathon? Um, obviously, one of the first things is a good working knowledge of where each uh, Merce object is located. Uh, when we get to looking at some of the objects themselves, you'll see that a lot of them are very densely um, uh, co-located. And so knowing which, which uh, Merce object you're looking at is really key if you're, especially if you're, if you're going to be doing this where you're, you're judged by a, an official or somebody's looking over your shoulder. Um, you, you know, you, in your training sessions, you want to develop that skill. You want to uh, know uh, your amounts, operations, and capabilities. So how it works and, and whether it has go-to or, uh, you know, if it's just a uh, an older scope where you have to push it or, or draw, you know, turn a knob or something like that, you know, how, you know, how many, how many degrees am I turning the knob to get uh, to a star? And of course, uh, you need to know some some of the stars and constellations. Uh, it, that's really kind of key to the whole thing. Uh, how to set up your your mount, how to balance your OTA, how to polar align uh, your scope, how to three star align your mount and scope. So so polar alignment is just getting lined up to the um, you know the sky to the to the heavens to the um, to our to the celestial um, axis, but then three star alignment is getting your scope so that it knows where it's located, where it's pointing at at, at that moment. So that's a, a, a really important skill. Making sure your finder uh, scope is aligned to your telescope, or your, that your telrad is aligned to your your main OTA. Star hopping is really key. Um, now you can use GoTo. I, th I think that if you're inexperienced go using GoTo, it's fine. I'm not going to say don't do that. Some of the if you're doing a competition, some competitions will will restrict you from from using the GoTo. And uh, just star hopping is one of those things that once you learn it, you get comfortable with it. You um, you know it's, it's something you will always enjoy doing. Uh, night operations. You're going to be looking through your telescope, recording your observations, you know, thinking about your next move, 
trying to figure out what how much time you have. So all those things, just just being able to move around the scope, um, you know, that kind of stuff. For Newtonian telescopes, uh, you know, you might have to learn how to collimate your scope. Okay, so so now we're talking about um, your mount, uh, how to set it up, kind of in a very broad sense. Uh, you have to make sure your type your when you're setting up, make sure your tripod is mechanically sturdy. So spreading the legs of the scope out, making sure that your eyepiece holder is securely bolted to the bottom. Okay, now the other, I guess the other thing is I'm talking about probably an older mount like I have. Some of you may have mounts that are entirely different, but you're going to have to still learn how to set that mount up and make sure that it's 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 sturdy and set up properly, and that when you touch it, it doesn't you know move or or shift um, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, is your mount adjusted to your latitude? Do you know how to do that? Um, all of our scopes, in order to be, to be aligned to uh, celestial uh, polar north, they have to be uh, mechanically adjusted to our latitude, to whatever latitude you're at. Uh, do you know how to move accurately in right ascension and declination? Um, if you have uh, a handheld controller, uh, do you know which buttons to move to go left, you know, right or left, right ascension, or, you know, or, or back? Uh, or go up or down declination. And does your handheld handheld controller have a, a database of Messier objects? That's actually very useful if you're starting out uh, and learning how to use that that database to to load and then go to uh, objects. So um, these are some of the constellations. I'm going to try and switch to. Um, my other screen, see if I can do that. Are you guys seeing that now or do I need to go back and stop sharing for a second? Let's go see your PowerPoint. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna share again. I think I... Um, I guess I'll share a screen too, Let's see if that works. Okay. Yeah, we see Solarium now. Yeah, okay, so uh, I, this is Stellarium, and this is, I, th I think, tonight. Uh, maybe not. Um, yeah, this is tonight. So if you look at these stars, can you tell me which stars are important to know? Um, it turns out that there are some navigation stars. These are the, uh, there are 57 stars in our um, hemisphere that are considered important enough to know for celestial navigation. And the US Naval Observatory keeps uh, ephemeral data on each, each of these stars so that you could you can navigate um, using uh, these stars. So if you can see any of these stars, you can figure out what your location is. Um, let's see. Now, if I, if I, um, if I turned off the names, would you be able to know? Would you? Could you tell me what stars these are? And I realize that in Stellarium, we're sort of looking at, looking at a distorted view, but uh, I'm trying to make a point that you need to to know your stars and and uh, constellations. Let me go back to. Okay, so you, are you seeing my PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. So I I guess I made that point. Uh, again, um, these are, um, you know, the names of stars. So this is a list of the stars that you have to know to, to be effective at uh, running a, or doing a marathon. Uh, I guess I mentioned that there, already, there are 57 that are important to, uh, I guess, navigation in the past. I guess we don't even use that anymore. Uh, going back to your mount setup, uh, you need to know how to orient the base so it's looking north. And you know how to, need to know how to adjust the legs so that it's level. And I'm, I guess the picture here shows that uh, the top of my legs the, is, is level. Um, 
you need to know how to lock the legs. Uh, the legs are adjustable so that the, the height is uh, set. Um, and then you need to know how to attach the OTA to your to your base. Uh, another skill, uh, polar aligning the scope. Uh, now some scopes won't have, uh, this is a polar, uh, polar alignment scope that's actually built into the mount. Uh, uh, some scopes have this, uh, some scopes don't. Uh, and even, uh, I guess a lot of newer scopes actually use uh, imaging software to, uh, to do the alignment. But uh, whatever tool you use or however you do this, you need to, to know that it's done and it's done properly and that you're looking, you know, at uh, at the North Star. And of course, I'm, I'm talking primarily about doing the <laughs> Messier Marathon in the, uh, the Northern Hemisphere, since most of those stars are, are pretty much in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, more, more skills. It's really, there's a lot of skills. Um, how to align your finder or your telrad. Uh, your finder scope is the scope you'll look through when you're trying to star hop. So you'll look through that, uh, go to a reference star, and um, you know it's a real comfort to know that your uh, finder scope is aligned and looking exactly at the same spot as your OTA. If it's not, you're really in trouble. So knowing how to align it um, is really important. And you do this during the day. Typically, people will say do this during the day because obviously it's it's much easier. You can pick a, a, a um, you know, some sort of object that's a mile or so away and it's not moving, make sure it's stationary. And typically we recommend you use a telephone pole or a fence post or even a, on the house a vent on a, on a house or something. Something about a mile away, something a little farther than that. If it's not quite a mile, that's fine too, but you basically wanna be able to look in your your OTA's eyepiece and get get that object centered in your eyepiece. And then you want to adjust the thumb screws or the, the adjustment screws on your finder so that both the eyepiece, both the view in your finder and the view in your OTA are, are the same and you're looking, you know, dead center at the, the same object. Um, also, once you get this done, you're probably gonna have to do it every so often. But if be careful when you're transporting your, your scope and your OTAs and make sure that they're not jostled or bumped so that you you misalign the two. There's nothing worse than setting up and, and finding five minutes after dark that you're not you're not aligned. Okay, Steve, star hopping. Steve, real quick, uh, this is a little off topic of, of uh, what you're saying here, but Joseph asks, is there a similar list for the Southern Hemisphere? And I actually don't know the answer to that. Is there is there an equivalent of a Messier marathon for the southern hemisphere? Uh, well, there certainly is is not a, a uh, not the same thing. I guess they, they could have. You know, there are certain uh, many of the objects are you know at or below the the equator, uh, and then on the other hand, there are a lot of um, objects that are almost circumpolar. They're almost um, you know, there, there are a number of them that are located, um, like, a, for example, um, M105, I think, is very close to the, the Big Dipper. And, of course, that's pretty close to the uh, kind of the top of our I think dome. What he was more asking, is there a, an Australian equivalent of Charles Messier that had a had a, any kind of similar list that maybe people try to see all of? Yeah, I, I guess I don't know. Um, none, none the, historically, I don't. Uh, I guess I don't know. And I, and given the character of the Aussie people, they probably have something that they you know do that similar. But I'm not. Sure, but I'm not aware of it. So, um, just getting back to um, the star hopping skill, it's really. Um, something that you have to kind of work at, develop, and build your own confidence in. It really is just going to a, a known reference star. 
uh, and then learning to move from that star to you know, the thing that you're looking for. Uh, I'm going to try and show that real quick in uh, Stellarium. So uh, I'm going to turn on the. So here is our celestial. This is looking uh, south. And if I were um, wanting to go from, from one object, well, let's go here, it's a little closer. So this is Betelgeuse. Um, and I'm going to scroll in somewhere. Whoops. Um, OK. I hope you all can see that uh, pretty well. So uh, let's say I wanted to go to <laughs> the Crab Nebula from Betelgeuse. Uh, Star hopping would be just going and looking at the charts and then figuring out, are there some uh, interesting uh, stars that I can see along the way to help me guide guide me to it or not? So I guess one of the first things I would try to try to do is try to go to this little asterism here, this little uh, triangle. And then once I got there, I would know that if I just go straight up uh, approximately, what? 20, um, 10 degrees. So knowing how to move your scope in declination is important now. So I would just, you know, scroll, you know, scroll my telescope up, might try and see if I could catch that star. Uh, and once I'm there. Steve, uh, I don't think that, I, I'm not sure if Jim's seeing the same thing, Adam, but I don't think we zoomed in when you did on Stellarium. I'm still seeing the oh, yeah. wide field view that you started out at. Um, really? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure why that is because I see your mouse going around, but um, we're still seeing the whole sky view. Oh, okay. Well, but earlier cool. you mentioned the star names, and I, I, we don't see star names either. We do see the meridian, but we don't see any of the other. Ah, oh, that's terrible. Okay. Um, all Maybe right. it's because you're sharing, are you sharing your screen or the Stellarium window? I don't know. I am sharing my screen. So let me see if I can do that and just uh, share the, so I'm going to stop sharing just really quickly and then go back to sharing. Whoops. Okay, I'm going to share just the Stellarium this time, see if that helps. How about now? Now it's moving around. Um, yes, now we can see. Yeah, now you're zooming in and out. Yes. Okay, great. All right. <clears throat> so let me just zoom out and sort of show you. Let's start again. So um, I, I want to go to the Crab Nebula. And I'm starting from Betelgeuse because it's a fairly close uh, reference star. Uh, maybe I could go from Aldebaran as well. Maybe that makes, makes more sense. Um, but <laughs> actually, let's just go to Betelgeuse because uh, we were talking about that. So um, again, you can see this little asteris asterism here, this uh, little triangle. So I might try with my scope. This is about um, one, one degree. No, I'm sorry, this is the hours. So this is actually quite a bit. Uh, but I might try to, to just, from here, I would try to go um, a little bit over in uh, right ascension and look for this guy here, this little uh, triangle. And then once I find that, I would just go straight up uh, about 10 degrees. And I should, should see this star along the way. And then eventually I should be able to get right to it. And... Uh, I don't know if you can see that or not. So there's the Crab Nebula. And it's about probably how it would look as well. So that's star hopping uh, in a nutshell uh, and using Stellarian and not actually out in the field, but uh, an attempt to kind of give you some idea of what, what it involves. It does take a little bit of confidence and it takes a little practice, but um, that's what, you know, running a marathon does. You've got to train for it. I'm going to stop sharing and go back to my other slide deck. OK, so we talked about star hopping a little bit. OK, um, 
if some of this seems redundant, I'm bringing new things in, in as I'm talking about them. Uh, so preparation, we're talking about getting ready to do our, our marathon. Uh, our telescope is all ready to go. We got our mount ready to go. We've, we've cleaned it up. We've assembled it. We've taken it out of the closet. Uh, we've put it all together. We played with it. We, we've, if we had to, we collimated it. We're now familiar with how the mount operates, how the focuser works, how the finder works. Uh, one of the questions I have is, are you familiar with all the power you're going to need for essentially 12 hours of operation? You're going to be out there from hopefully just an hour before sunset to sunset, sunrise at the next day. So you're going to need a lot of, you know, you're going to have to understand what your power requirements are. Um, in terms of other things to prepare, you know, your finder scope, uh, dew heaters are important if, or, or some sort of uh, dew strategy is important. Um, a lot of people these days are putting lasers on their on their scopes in a similar fashion that they would use it um, like a a finder scope or a, um, a telrad. Um, it's really, it's really amazing. You can, uh, if you have a, have a laser on your, on your OTA, you can turn it on and, and point it right at uh, Polaris and get, get polar aligned much, uh, very quickly. It's, it's really useful. So these kinds of accessories, uh, you have to make, you know, you, if you're going to have them, make sure you have them and they're ready to go. Here's a picture of my hand holding a um, uh, hand controller and the hand controller shows that uh, I have a Messier catalog in my scope. So I can use that to help me uh, in my training sessions to go find the, the objects I'm looking for. Steve, you have another Facebook question. Do you know why using RA and declination are allowed but not computer assisted? Um, so he says, you know, they're essentially the same thing. You're just just doing it manual is less accurate. Well, um, you know, I mean, I think there's a certain amount of, of uh, pride in, in doing it through the, um, uh, you know, star hopping or, or some of those kinds of, of methods. Uh, it's, it's really, I think, just a um, historical and a maybe a cultural thing. Um, some of the older um, astronomers just feel that the, uh, you know, they've learned the sky better by doing it that way. I I think that it, to try to do a Messier marathon, starting out, not having a lot of experience, just doing heart, star hopping is going to be frustrating. So I think, you know, try the, try the star hopping. Uh, you know, when you get to the point where you're, for example, when you're trying to do the um, Virgo cluster, or the uh, Sagittarius, I don't know if it's called a cluster or not, but uh, basically the, Virg uh, the Virgo cluster is a really dense packing of a bunch of galaxies. And unless you've actually spent a lot of time looking at that, those galaxies and, and really you know, able to discern the differences in them, you might, you might get lost. You might not know what you're looking at. So, um, you know, I guess I'm, I'm getting a little off track with your question, but the, the, the answer is uh, it's just the way things have been done and it's a kind of a traditional thing, I guess. So, uh, Going back to power, you're going to be out there all night from, like I said, sunset to sunrise. Uh, do you have uh, batteries for all the devices you're taking out there? Um, some, uh, some of your eyepieces have a illuminated reticle. Do you have batteries for those? Uh, if you're going to be using that, Telrads uh, traditionally have a battery in them. Your scope is going to be run off a of battery, probably. Your flashlights, uh, all that stuff. Do you have batteries for all those devices? Are they fresh? And do you have backups for every one of them? So you've got to consider that in your preparation. More preparation. Um, the OTA, OTA, is it clean? Do you have you clean the optics in it? Have you, you, uh, we have some really excellent uh, videos on, uh, actually, I'm not sure if we have those on there, but we certainly have given fundamentals courses on how to clean uh, optics. Are your eyepieces clean? 
Um, do you understand the difference between the parent field of view for your eyepieces and the true field of view? Um, if you understand that and you know what the true field of view of each of your eyepieces is, that's a really important piece of information when you're out there looking through your scope. If you know, uh, let's see, I talked about that here. So yeah, so um, each eyepiece, when you buy it, has got a, a parent uh, field of view. It's just really amazing. Some of them are 82, 82 degrees, 68 degrees. Um, but you're not going to look through an eyepiece and see 82 degrees of space. You're going to see much, much smaller. But knowing what that much, much smaller is, is going to really be useful for you when you're looking through it and, and you see two stars and you know that they're approximately so many degrees apart, so many you know, um, arc seconds apart. And you know that your eyepiece is so many arc seconds or arc, or arc minutes apart. It'll help you doing your star, star hopping. It's really key. So there's a formula for it. Uh, it's based on both the focal length of your OTA. And then it's also um, based on the focal length of your eyepiece. And so I've, I've got some, some examples here. Uh, I got my little guy here. Yeah, okay, so a 34 millimeter eyepiece with a 600 uh, uh, millimeter focal length OTA gives me a, a magnification of 17 times. And if I have an eyepiece that has 68 degree field of view, apparent field of view, its true field of view is 3.9 deg degrees. And that's really pretty big for, for doing star hopping. You really, that's the cat's meow, so. Uh, and you can see these other examples as well. And you can see that as you get higher up in, in magnification, your your um, field of view gets gets narrower. Um, and actually, before we go on, let me let me give you a quick demo of that. I'm going to try and do that on. The, so let's go back to Stellarium, and I'm going to try and do this without completely screwing up the computer. Uh, okay, so so right now we're looking at the night sky, and uh, over here I've got uh, my eyepieces, and so I can. This is uh, my thirty-four millimeter eyepiece. You can see it's got a quite a quite a uh, wide field. We're not we're not seeing your share, Steve. Oh, okay. <laughs> hold on. Sorry, I had too many things to do here. What happened to my shear thingy? Share screen. Okay. How about now? Can you see Stellarium again? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. So let's go look at uh, let's go look at Orion here. I'm going to scroll in on the belt here, and I'm going to. Click on that guy and then turn on my telescope. So can you see that? Yes. Okay. Well, you can see that we're looking at the belt and that we can see some nebulous stuff going on here. It's pretty wide field. And now I'm gonna to change to, uh, what am I gonna to change to? I'm gonna to go to, so this is now my 24 millimeter eyepiece. And you can see the field got a little narrower and, um, and now when I change to my eight millimeter, you can only see just that center star and a, f and a few stars around it. So uh, that gives you an, an example of, of what the actual true field of view will look like when you're, when you're using it. Okay, and I'm gonna stop sharing that and go back to, my slides again. Okay, another thing in the area of preparation, uh, miscellaneous equipment. I mentioned dew heaters earlier. Um, those have to be in working order. Uh, do you have red flashlights and are they, do they work when you turn them on? Sometimes the contacts get corroded or they, they don't work. Um, having logbooks, notebook, uh, you know, a notebook, paper, pencils, all that stuff, 
have all that equipment ready to go. Decide what you're going to be eating and drinking while you're out there. Uh, you're going to be out there for roughly 12 hours or more. Uh, it's important to, to hydrate. Uh, table and chair. You know, you, you, you're going to be out there for a long time. You want you want to have your gear and your, your log stuff set out, and you want to be able to sit down and relax. Uh, if you're doing a marathon in, in uh, March and April, it's going to be cold at night. So you have jackets, gloves, a hat. You, know, you don't want to be out there and suddenly realize, oh, this T-shirt's not going to handle the nighttime. Uh, it'll just be miserable. Uh, here's one thing that I've done in my preparation. I've, I've marked up my Sky Atlas. This is my pocket Sky Atlas. This is a picture of it. Uh, you don't have to get this one. There are other ones, and I'll, show, I'll mention those really quickly in a moment. But I've taken some masking tape, some blue um, masking tape, and cut it into little wedges, and I've marked all of the locations of uh, the messy objects in my atlas. And I take that because it doesn't require batteries, and it's, it's easy to use, and it's easy to see. Uh, the, the thing I like about this Pocket Sky Atlas is that it has a lot of handy reference materials and a lot of a lot of uh, well-designed ideas in it. For example, if I'm if I'm looking here and I want to go this direction in in the star star, uh, star charts, I can see that uh, page looks like page 55 is the next uh, set of um, sky charts over. Or if I want to go north, it looks like I have to go to page 42. Uh, it also has both uh, hour angles and declinations along the side, so I could easily figure out uh, some star hopping strategies by looking at uh, these stars and where I want to go, what, which target I'm trying to find. Um, there are other sky, sky atlases. There's a Uranometria uh, um, Atlas 2000. You can even use, obviously, laptop-based uh, uh, cars to CL. Um, phone apps. I, I don't really particularly care for phone apps because I don't like lights or it's hard to make sure that those are red light. Uh. Okay, so let's talk about practice. Um, train like a marathon, right? Progressive training is really key. If you're, if you're a marathon runner, you don't go out and run the marathon, you know, after having sat at home in the wintertime, you know, for the last six months. So you, you start progressively training. That means a lot of short training sessions. Uh, you practice all the things we've talked about, setting up your scope, doing the polar alignments, mount operations, star hopping, as often as you can. Over time, you, you want to learn and you want to navigate to find and, and experience as many of these messy objects as you can before the game day. And there's really no excuse. So let me, uh, well, I guess I'll uh, move on. Uh, if a messy marathon is like a real marathon, then what's a half marathon? Well, it's about six hours of, of being out in the field. A 10K is just three hours. That's, that's really easy, right? That's like setting up your telescope after dinner and spending a couple hours outside in the backyard. So try to get a couple of 10Ks in every week. Um, okay, so we talked about star hopping. Um, the distances in your eyepiece field. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me back up. You want to understand the distance within your eyepiece field. Uh, so we talked about that. So um, this, that combined with your star charts will help you plan your moves for how to get from the reference star to, to where you want to go and, and write them down. Uh, there are uh, some books that will actually have those written up for you. They've, you know, other people have, have done this before and they've created their own sets of, of moves and, um, you know, they're good, but, uh, you know, everybody has their way of learning things. So if, if you get out there and try it your way and it works for you, then it works for you. Um, but you got to practice it. Now there's another method. Uh, it's called the Pennington method, and it's pretty not very well known. There was a gentleman who wrote a Messier Marathon book, uh, Harvard Pennington, uh, back in the I think 
the late 70s. And he, you know, like a lot of people, he said, oh, hey, I can figure this out, not so much by going up, up five and down three or, you know, that kind of thing, but by just imagining a shape from a couple of reference stars that helps me to find that, that, that third star or that third object. And so um, his book um, has a bunch of these uh, objects that he has, has uh, you know, written out and saying, you should try, that, try it this way. So here's an example of M51 uh, with the, the, the Big Dipper. And he's saying that if you imagine a, uh, a right triangle that's sort of pointed down uh, if you just look for where the two the, the two lines from the other two stars cross, and then put your scope there, that that's a good way to to start essentially star hop. And he also has these other uh, examples: uh, M101 and 102 uh, being an equilateral triangle with uh, you know Alcade and Mizar being the you know one edge of the the triangle. Uh, again, over here on the other side, um, you know, these two M, well, I guess he's really talking about M, M106, but if you imagine uh, this star and this star being uh, an isosceles triangle, uh, then if you, you know, if you said, okay, it's got to be right around here because this is to make this a, that shape. Um, and it works. I've tried it. It's, it's really, uh, it's useful as well. Okay, so we're now talking about game day, uh, knowing the course. Wh what are we talking about? Well, there are things that you're going to experience throughout the, the time that you're running the marathon that you could think of, uh, of as the course. So the very first obstacle is twilight. Twilight is a period of time when you're, you're, you're moving from light to dark and there, that, that period of time is when the stars will start to, to or the, the objects will start to appear. Uh, the light that's scattered from the, um, you know, from our atmosphere starts to, to be minimized because there's less sunlight. And so we get the, um, uh, the extinction, I guess it's not the extinction, but it's the opposite ex extinction. These lights are, these objects are coming into view. And so you're going to want to try and be aware of that right when you start your your marathon you want to you want to try and start looking for the objects as soon as you can um you're going to have pretty much once it starts once it gets dark you're going to have smooth sailing uh many of the objects are are scattered in such a, a you know they're they're scattered about enough that it's easy to get from the one to the next and, and be certain where you're at and, 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 and not be confused. But when you get to the Virgo cluster, uh, and we'll see that a little bit later, you know, there are five or six galaxies all clustered together and you're gonna be fighting that, trying to figure out where you're at. Uh, so that's a, another obstacle in, your, in your, your run. You're gonna be fighting fatigue. You're gonna be tired. It's gonna be cold. You're gonna have been out there for eight, nine hours. Uh, that's something just like a regular marathon, you're going to be fighting that. You're going to be fighting the cold and the dew. Those will be, you know, as soon as uh, the sun goes down, about an hour later, you're, you're going to start noticing that things are getting cool, cold, and, and some, play, some things are actually starting to, to do up. So you're going to be fighting that the whole night. Uh, I like to think of the the Sagittarius cluster, the all of those uh, globular clusters, as the wall because it's almost at the end of the marathon. Uh, you've got maybe an hour, hour and a half before the sun comes up, and you've got a lot of a lot of uh, objects to look at. So I always think of that as uh, a metaphor for the wall in uh, a Mar um, Missy Marathon. And you're going to be racing against the sun. The sun will be coming up, um, and you'll be f still trying to get all the objects in Sagittarius um, as the sun's coming up. So you'll be racing against it to get um, get all those things recorded. So that's the course. 
want to talk a little bit about um, the difference between civil nautical and astronomical twilight. Um, when the sun goes down, or when the sun comes up, actually, as well, if, depending on whether you're, you know, you're day or night, you're going to experience that periods of twilight. And um, so let's let's just talk about sun uh, sunset. Uh, during the, the day, the the stars and all the objects are obscured by our our sun's reflected light on our atmosphere. Uh, but we've defined these different zones of, of darkness and pretty much you will not see anything in in the what's called the civil twilight zone. And that's the first six degrees. Uh, that's when the sun's the center is essentially six degrees below the horizon. And I don't know if you can see these other the definitions, but civil twilight is defined as the sun's um, center being uh, you know, zero, zero to six degrees below the horizon. Nautical is defined as six to 12, and then astronomical is defined as 12 to 18. You, you're going to start seeing stars and objects in the nautical twilight, but you're really, you know, you, you won't see all of them until at least astronomical, and then that, after that, you'll you have smooth sailing. So you have to be aware that that's something that's going to happen, and that you're going to have to deal with it. Um, okay, game day. We're here. We're ready to go. We've, we've done our practice. We've done all of our training sessions. Uh, our overall strategy is to get there early. We want to get there before sunset. You've, you've learned how to set up your scope. It's going to be easy to set up. You're going to plop it down. You're going to know where north is, and you're going to set it all up. You're going to wait for that, um, uh, nautical twilight and start looking for your first targets. Now the targets, and I'll, and I'll show you when I, when we do our marathon here shortly, uh, you're going to work from west to east. The, the objects that are uh, on the west of your meridian are the ones that are going to be setting the soonest. So you want to get those objects first. You, it's a real rush to get all those west westerly objects and then work your way east so that those objects, as they're rotating past your meridian, you can get them as well. So you, you're working from uh, basically from west to east and then from south to north. So the, the objects that are you know, below the equator or objects that are lower in the sky are going to set first, uh, set sooner than the, the objects that are higher elevations. Uh, again, begin your search as soon as you can. Nautical twilight is, is I think, a, a good rule of thumb. Uh, view as many as you can, as early as you can. There, I, I read some discussions you know, on cloudy nights about sleeping. It's possible to take a nap if you're if you're confident you can take a nap before the Virgo cluster. Uh, usually, that's when people try to do it. Uh, really plan your sequence through the Virgo cluster. Uh, you know, know where, which ones you're going to go to first and how you're going to move through there. And, and if you've done some training with with that area, it should be, uh, well, it shouldn't be too faint, painful would probably be the best way to say it. Same thing with the objects in and around the Sag Sagittarius. Um, you know, prepare your, your sequence through, through that area as well. When you get to Sagittarius, you're going to be close, at least this year, you're going to be very close to sunrise, unless you're really quick, unless you're really good, I guess. Um, view as many objects as you can down to the eastern horizon. Obviously, things are rising from the east, and so if they're rising, you have much, much more time. You'll have more time. Of course, the backside of that is that you're also, uh, the sun is also coming up in the east, so try to stay on schedule. Um, okay, I talked about most of this stuff. Do control. Um, you got to keep things covered, eyepieces, your lens caps, put them in plastic bags, or if you have a, a eyepiece case, uh, make sure that if you're not using it, it gets put away so it doesn't get dewed over. Cover your scopes and your binoculars when they're not in use. Um, if you can plasticize your charts or, or if you can put them in a plastic bag, that, that works great. Cover your logbook uh, and anything that might get damp 
and not work well when it's wet. Uh, more game day stuff, hydrate, drink plenty of water, try to, try to drink all night. I, I typically drink, uh, I don't know, eight, maybe eight bottles of water a night when I'm doing this. Again, dress for the weather. It's going to be really, it, it will be cold. You, you'll be, you know, it, maybe it's going to be April and it feels nice. It might be 70 degrees, but as soon as the sun goes down, uh, especially here in Illinois, it'll, it'll get cold. Uh, this next one, avoid uh, diuretics. I drink coffee when I'm there, so I, I guess I, I can't really recommend that. But I, you know, some people don't drink coffee. They try to avoid that. Uh, and bring food, bring whatever you like to eat. I, I like salted almonds. I think my wife is watching, so. Okay, you're done. You finished. Um, it's probably gonna hurt. <laughs> this is a picture of Haley Carruthers. She did a marathon and uh, collapsed right at the finish line and she walked up and she crawled over and quite amazing. Now that you've done this, um, you can actually get an award for it or not so much the marathon where you did everything at one night. The Astronomical League has a uh, an observer's program for Messier objects. Uh, you can get a certificate for recording and logging 7D objects uh, or you can get the certificate in and pin if you if you uh, observe and record all 110. The uh, Astronomical League has some stricter rules than uh, my, myth, my myth, marathon. They, uh, they don't allow go-tos, only star hopping. You have to keep a detailed log. And if you go to their website, you can see the log info. Uh, and they also require multiple nights of observing. So you, you couldn't do 70 objects uh, in one night, record them all and, and get the certificate. So there's the link to the, the Messier object, uh, uh, the observer's program for uh, the Astronomical League. Okay, uh, let's see. I've got some sources here. I'm gonna, so there are two books that I'd like to talk about. The book by Harvard Pennington. Um, he was, uh, like I said, he was just a guy out in California who was into astronomy. Uh, the sad thing is that he, he passed away before he finished his book. And all of his friends gathered his materials and they took it to, uh, I guess, uh, the same people who do Sky and Telescope. And they, they worked together to finish his book. And so it's really quite a good book. I, I, I really like it. The other uh, book is uh, Observing Guide uh, to Missing Marathons. Uh, by Don Matchholtz. Uh, he's a really famous guy. He's done a lot of uh, comet hunting and uh, published a lot of articles in Sky and Telescope and other places. Um, so the last thing I have, well, I have some sources to show you. These are some links on the, on the web where you can go and read more stuff. Um, and I think you're probably seeing also a, um, some links in, on Facebook. And the last thing we're going to do tonight is a um, an actual marathon. We're going to really do it. So here we go. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a Stellarium uh, simulation. Uh, I have a script loaded up here, and we're going to run it, and it'll simulate a complete marathon uh, for this year uh, in March. Uh, and it'll compress basically 12 hours into five minutes. So here we go. You notice the sun is just going down and you can see the, of course, when the sun is going down, you don't have twilight, but as soon as the sun goes down, you have uh, the start of the three twilights I mentioned. And you can see it's sort of going below the horizon. And now you can be in, you begin to see some of the, uh, the deep sky objects coming into uh, focus or coming so you can see them, uh, the extinction, I'm not sure if it's called the extinction when they're coming in, but uh, you can see them coming and shortly we'll start a marathon when we have enough objects.
There we go. Now the sequence that uh, the simulation is running, the, the objects it's picking in succession, are the is the sequence that was recommended by uh, Harvard Pennington and then a number of other people. And I think it's also the same uh, sequence as uh, Astronomy Magazine's uh, list. But um, you know, you're you're welcome to use whatever sequence you want and however you feel is the most efficient for your telescope and for your skill sets. You see down in the right corner, you see uh, the object being selected and its declination. Well, um, some of them are pretty high above the equatorial plane. Some of them are below the uh, equatorial plane. You'll also notice that on the right, on the left, oh, sorry, right side, that the objects are fairly well distributed. So that makes it easier for finding them. If you look to the right up here, you can see this really clustered group of objects. This is the Virgo cluster I talked about. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, deep sky objects all move crunched together, and uh, it's a difficult uh, navigating that field. And, and so that's what one of the reasons why I, uh, I mentioned it in the marathon tour or marathon course. You'll also notice that I don't really have a good handle in this zoom in, zoom out thing, I'm trying to get the object so that you can see it, but also a wide enough field of the sky that you can uh, uh, see what's going on as well. I'm going to turn off the equatorial line so you can kind of see just this, this, the constellation outlines and the objects themselves. It'd be nice if we could do that in real life. Or turn them on, I guess. So here we go through the, the, the Virgo galactic cluster. This is a place in the sky where uh, a whole bunch of galaxies are are clustered together in the fabric of the universe. And looks like we have a surprise tonight. We have a quarter moon coming up off the east. You'll have to deal with these kinds of issues, I guess, when you're doing your marathon. This is, of course, for the first week in March of, of 2021. And you also notice there's another dense cluster of, of uh, these are globular clusters. Uh, um, this is the Sagittarius cluster that I talked about. This is also what I refer to as the, the wall when you're running your marathon. <laughs> And you also note that on the east eastern boundary, the sky is starting to lighten up. So we're headed into uh, uh, sunrise. And we're 11 hours into our, our marathon. So how are you feeling? Pretty tired? It's a race now. You've got just a little bit of daylight left, or darkness left. And you're, you can see that the sun's starting to peek over. You'll also notice some of the stars over on the western side are starting to, to or on the eastern side are starting to go extinct. They're starting to, the, the sc light scattering from the sun is starting to compete with their brightness and they're starting to wink out. So you're in trouble. And we've only got 93, 94. I don't think we're gonna make it. Uh -oh. we're done. And that's it. That is uh, 
our simulated marathon for 2021. I hope you enjoy it. Drew, I'll turn it over to you. I'm done. If there are any other questions. Uh, there are no more Facebook questions, no email questions. So I think we're probably good. Folks, uh, thank you very much for attending tonight. Uh, thank you again, Steve, for your uh, presentation. And uh, as, uh, as I was always say, folks, if you follow us on Facebook, we'll have uh, announcements about our upcoming programs. And definitely visit our club website at naperastro.org, where our calendar is kept up to date. You can see there already the next uh, couple months worth of our monthly meeting programs and our fundamentals presentations are listed there so you can look a little ahead there. Otherwise for tonight, uh, again, thank you all for joining us. And uh, if you are watching this in the future on YouTube, um, somewhere around there's that going to be that uh, subscribe button. So uh, subscribe and do us a favor and add to our list of subscribers. Otherwise for now, uh, I hope you all have a good evening, and we look forward to seeing you uh, in the virtual world again uh, before long, and keep on looking up and enjoying astronomy. Good night.